I just want to thank Dr. Friday uh, for talking about rapid ohia death. It's something that the university and the scientists working on the issue are really making a concerted effort to get the word out. And um, it seemed like a great opportunity to sort of complement that. I'm going to turn this over to yeah. Dr. Friday and say thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mahalo. So thank you everybody for coming out and for being here. Sorry for boring you by school and watching a lot of this. Um, yeah, so I'm talking about rapid ohia. I, I, I should think of relating this more to Mauna Kea. Um, so I guess to, to start out, I'm the extension forester with the University of Hawaii. So I'm with the college, the UH Manoa College of Tropical Agriculture. Our largest extension office, however, is right up the road here in the village. So I'm right here. I'm also affiliated with Chilo faculty with the PCBS program. And so I've mentored some students who do the, the Chilo program also. Um, I work with professionals and land managers, private land managers across the islands. Um, also in the Pacific, I've got a project in Guam, Mariana, stuff like that, on how to take care of forests. A few years ago, I started getting a lot of calls from people in this subdivision, which happens to be Leilani, saying our Ohia trees are dying. Original thought was, well, he is he's always got it. The first couple of places I visited, he had some dead trees and we couldn't find anything. And then a couple of years later, it started to be evident that there was a lot of mortality and um, spreading rapidly. Um, rapidly is a disease. So, the metaphor of a slow fire here is it's taken out a lot of forest, it's jumping to further spots now, especially on Mauna Kea. Our efforts now are not hit head on, but try to stop. The further spread and then around. So that metaphor of a fire. I do want to point out that this isn't something that scientists found out in the forest and we're telling you about this, is something community people brought to our attention as scientists said, hey, this is a problem. What can we do about it? A whole lot of teamwork on this. We have state, we have federal, we have university, we have USGS, um, people working together on this. We've got outstanding support from the State Department of Agriculture. Of course, forestry and wildlife, a lot of it is the Air Force to try to take care of the Invasive Species Committee, especially the Ghana Invasive Species Committee, uh, the Watershed Partnerships, the Mountain Alliance, Mauna Kea, Kola Watershed Partnerships, um, international, Gavi is South Africa, Iowa State, um, some definitely international. I just got back from New Zealand where I had very interested audiences who were afraid for their food Kala. Um, the New Zealanders, however, as you notice, we can do anything there. They take biosecurity seriously. We do not because we're Americans. We don't like regulations. So anybody can bring anything here. New Zealanders know you cannot bring things to New Zealand because disease is spread. Um, we've also had um, good funding so far. We have startups by a bunch of the foundations, like Community Foundation, Atherton Foundation, Gordon and Teddy Moore Foundation, um, started out some funding as the state kind of kicked in here supporting. The ledge now is deciding if they want to keep supporting this or they want to go off support something else. So there's one one more piece of legislation relating to rapid ohia death. If you go on and want to add support to that, and if you can. I meant to look up the number of the Senate bill, but I didn't. It's no no here to schedule on it. But if you look relating to rapid ohia death, we can find something. Um, the governor's budget had three and a half million, which is what we asked for for this, um, and then it. One of those things where they just delete the number and then they do things behind closed doors and they came to pleasure to get a number. So I know a lot more about trees than I do about politics. So I can't really tell you what's going on with that. Um, these are two photos of um, same spot. The red spot is the same spot, four years apart. What I want you to see is four years later, there are a lot of dead trees. Um, it's a discrete area. So down here, the trees are fine. Up here, this is a discrete area. When we looked at a landscape puna wide of it, we see these areas are, are one to 100 acres in size of dead trees, and then it's healthy outside. Then not all the trees are dead. There's healthy one, there's healthy, plenty of healthy trees left in, so it's a mix. Um, so it looks like a pathogen. It doesn't look like the kind that just spreads out, killing everything right. We were even, we were, when first we see these trees dying, they all lined up on the rift zone. Uh, they all lined up on the rift zone. We did a GIS analysis, does line up on lava flow, does it line up on the it, they lined up on um, rift zones. And we started talking with Don, Hem Don Hems. We talked with Don Hems too, because we asked about fungus. But we talked about Don Thomas, about volcanic activity, what would happen to that, and talked about underground CO2 and other such things. That was all right here. And once it started spreading, all that correlation went out the window. Um, then what we see on the ground watching it, and this comes from working with 
landowners who are telling us what this looks like. And they said that, look, this tree looked beautiful, was flowering two weeks ago. Now it's kind of yellow, and two weeks it turns brown. Two weeks later, the leaves fall off. Very rapid. Now, who was here in the 80s and the 70s? So you may remember there was a lot of Ohia mortality at Mauna Loa, Mauna Kea, the Ohia decline, the Ohia was slowly dying back. And as you drive Saddle Road, if you look on the Kea side, you see thousands of acres of dead Ohia stubs. Now what you do see underneath them is healthy young Ohia coming back. That was a slow decline though. Those trees over years would slowly go down. This is weeks and it goes down, or at least weeks from initial onset of visual symptoms. It dies, that's an important distinction on that. What it can do, this is a lowland Ohia forest. We don't have too much of that left. This is below Pahoa. It's a beautiful forest in the cinder cone below Pahoa. It had all kinds of things in it. It had, uh, well, here's a botanist. If I start throwing up botanical names, botany, some, some, some. So this, okay, what's the Hawaiian name for the native Sertandras? I can't ever remember. Key Lave. Anyway, with the Sertandra Nanavalensis, who's down here, so endangered plants here, beautiful Ohia Lama, Alahe'e. Um, this is what it looks like today. We have almost 100% mortality in this forest, really badly hit. There's that one tree over there that's still alive. Is that an escape? I don't know. Maybe it just didn't get the disease yet, or maybe it's resistant. We don't know. We want to look at that. So it can be really bad mortality. Where is the forest going as a forest um, in low elevations? So this is all Paleopuna. Low elevations, what you've got coming in all the understory is solid strawberry wall. So when you lose the Ohia overstory in this forest, you have thousands of acres of strawberry log patch. This forest is on its way out. There's really nothing we can do at any scale to save this. I mean, you can save an acre, you can save 10 acres, while Kelly Opun is 30,000 acres. Um, this we're going to have to triage and write off. This up the mountain, what you've got underneath is Hapu, you've got some of the other ones. You're going to, even in this case with a lot of mortality, it's going to be a native forest, but it's going to be a native forest that is a different one than we've known before. It's going to be heavier in the koa. It's going to be heavier in the hapu. It's going to have less oki in it. But I, I hope, and I think it still will have ohia in it. This is a map of where we found it in the island. So our initial diagnosis of it was in, so the first diagnosis of the fungal pathogen, this was 2014. Our initial diagnosis was down here, Leilani OP cow area. Um, by the next year, it was through Leilani, Lower Puna, Orchid Land, that area. By um, 2015, we had found it in Hilo, up around, and then up the Kona Coast by 2015, last year. This year, the most recent ones that we, um, anyway, um, the things that are giving us headaches right now, there are a couple up there in Kukaiao, a couple in Lapohoyo and Kamae, moving up that big section of that's the biggest, for those of you who know the forest, that's the biggest trees, the largest, the deepest Ohia forest in the state is that area there. Um, these are lab diagnosis samples, so these are not what Ron said, oh I saw it. These are ones that you saw it, someone brought it to the lab and tested it and we found it is indeed the fungus. Um, so these are lab diagnosis samples, what it is. So Monday I'm headed, it looks like there's a lot over here, so I'm headed over here Monday to check out and see what's over there. This, on the other hand, is a complementary way of surveying for it. This is an aerial survey of trees that have the symptoms from the air. So on one hand, you have the pinpoints that are diagnosed, which there are, last I asked the lab, Lisa said she'd done, uh, oh, I didn't introduce my other two co the other two leads on this are Dr. Lisa Keith, who is the pathologist at the USDA ARS, and Dr. Flint Hughes, who's a forest ecologist with the US Forest Service. Flint Hughes and I were working on it for like two years before we got Lisa involved. Neither of us are pathologists, neither of us were able to diagnose the disease. She got involved, she knew how to diagnose diseases. She diagnosed it right away, and I'll get into some of the work that she's done. Um, this is symptoms from the air. So you see this heavy concentration, lower puna, points through quite a lot of it here in Kona, um, and then points that look symptomatic. For example, those ones up in Kohala, we have chased those down, and that's something else. It's not rapid of the It's not this disease. So these are things from the air, but they, they, they um, overlap pretty well. While I'm on the topic of surveys from the air, I'm going to run through a bunch of the different avenues that we're researching and looking at, trying to understand what's going on here. This is Greg Asner's plane 
He's at the Stanford uh, Carnegie Airborne Institute, uh, Carnegie Institute um, in the Carnegie Airborne Observatory. His plane is equipped with GPS, so all his data is GPS located. LIDAR, which is the laser, which gives him exact measurements of the core structure at a very fine scale. And a spectrophotometer, which gives you wavelengths. Now, you know when you look out of the forest and you can see kukui trees, because they're that kind of light color? That's because your eye is seeing different ratios of wavelengths. Well, with Greg's spectrophotometer and his computer, the computer can tell every different kind of tree in the forest. Um, because each one has a little bit different spectral signature. And he's doing this on a centimeter resolution. So last year, he flew the whole island, centimeter resolution. He had a grant from, anyway, some big mainland foundation, like the Hearst Foundation or something. You know, $250,000 to fly the whole island, get all the data from it, and he's been working on it ever since. Um, but the stuff that he's finding, so it's georectified, so you can overlay the vegetation on the lava flows, so understand the ecology of it. And the, this is a, one of his images. What he's able to find is, so the light fuzzy stuff is all busy. This is Leilani. Leilani here, the hole is up there. Um, this orange and yellow stuff is Okia. The brown is dead Okia. The orange is stressed Okia. So his thing is able to look at not only species, but species, pull out whether something is water stressed. And again, I'm gonna get to how the disease works, but it, the, the, what's happening physiologically is the leaf is getting water stressed, and he's able to see that. This, we're hoping, will tell us where it's going. So we're just chasing where we see the trees already dying. But where is it stressing the trees before they're dying? The other thing with this is we're able to understand, we really hope this helps us understand more of the ecology of disease. Why does it occur where it occurs and doesn't occur so much in other places? This is uh, getting back into the actual on the ground work. So this was um, uh, two years ago now? This would have been summer of 2014. So two and a half years ago, almost three years ago, when we actually did the diagnosis. The diagnosis was felling the disease trees, looking at them, and what we saw was these brown or black sort of staining pattern, sort of a sunburst staining pattern. But as soon as Lisa saw that, she's like, aha, that is what we want to culture. Took it out. We filled a lot of trees to diagram where we see the fungus in the tree, took it back and cultured it, um, and found the, the uh, fungus Ceratocystis. Now, Ceratocystis is a genus of fungi, causes disease in many, many places, many different, and what they do is they name each species after the tree it infects. So, uh, the Ceratus cacao funesta is the disease of cacao. The serratus acacia bora is the disease of acacia. The serratus platina is the disease of platinus, which is plain trees, etc. Um, so we found this big red flag. This was the first time a serratus cystis had ever been recovered from Ogea. We had, in looking at this the previous year, the year before, we had recovered Pythium, Fusarium, Phycophthora, a bunch of fungi that shouldn't have been killing the trees. So that's why we were kind of at sea for a while. When you check on this, it's like, aha. This is a new disease, this is fungus killing. Now, you get a new fungus in a tree, the tree doctor, like I said, it had Pythium and Pythophora head, and you can find a bunch of different fungi. What you, the, the tests to show pathogenicity is you inoculate seedlings with a fungus. So a little slice in the bark, a little piece of paper with the fungal culture on it, several seedlings, several control seedlings, a little piece of paper with distilled water, um, inoculated and wrapped it up and then, curiously, nothing happened. And Lisa was getting really disappointed that nothing happened for weeks and weeks. And it wasn't until a couple months later she saw the first bit of wilting from where she inoculated it. The other thing is, see in this here? See this, the sprouts coming down here? That's when something is sprouting, it's indicative of something's happening to disrupt the tree and the sprouts start, start coming out. So, inoculate it. Um, and then a few days after this, the whole this turns brown, the rest of it turns brown. You cut it open, you see that same black staining that you saw on the mature tree. You culture out the black staining, you get the same fungus you inoculated with. That completes the cycle. Okay? So now we've diagnosed in the lab study Ceratocystis. The Ceratocystis, we did the study 2013, wrote it up, was published early 2015. It's now 2017. We're two years into a research program on this. To give you a little comparison on tree diseases, Dutch elm disease, I think, was discovered around 1904. 
uh, I'm sorry, chestnut blight. Two years ago, I was at a big research project on chestnut blight. They're still doing research. They suddenly figured out how to deal with chestnut blight. It's 100 years into it. Dutch elm disease, they're 60 years into working with how can we deal with Dutch elm disease. We're two years. Um, the leg seems to think we'll throw some money, we'll solve it onto a new problem next year. These are, this is a century long process that we're in, we're, we're in year three now. Um, ideally, yes. Now, the situation gets more complicated. Um, when we started looking, we found two new species of fungus infecting and killing ovia trees. Um, how is that? Um, Wade Heller, I kind of got it out of order here. Anyway, Wade Heller is a molecular biologist, postdoc with Lisa brought him on. He developed the uh, QPCR analysis to find the DNA of this fungus. And as we recovered this fungus, we recovered, it two, turned out there were two separate ones. Now, once you have the DNA of the fungus, you can put it in the family tree of known ceratocystis, which there are about a thousand known ones. When you put it on the family tree, the cladogram, you find out that the ones that we get from Hokia are in two different branches of the tree. What we're calling A is related to ones on plane trees in Syngonium. What we're calling B is related to ones on Cairo. Um, quite unrelated branch to the family tree. There's another well-known pathogen in Hawaii that is on Ipomea batata, sweet potato. Different pathogen, you have different one on the family tree. So we have two different diseases of Wokia that we're finding here, and these were unique. Like I said, there are a thousand known genotypes of ceratocystis, roughly, and this didn't match any of them, and the pathologist as the catalog goes, of course. We're only chasing down the ones that cause problems. There are many, many hundreds more out there that if they don't cause problems, we don't bother looking at them. So um, two new ones. Then the plot thickens a little bit. The A1 is similar as the family from the Caribbean, the clade from the Caribbean side. The B1 is the family from an Asian side. So the one that infects also taro is related to other ones in the Asian family. The one that infects plane trees and sigonium is related to the ones in the Caribbean family. We think this one is the more virulent one, one that's really causing a lot of the, the mortality. Maybe the other one has been here, or just one of those things that killed ohia trees over the years. Um, obviously, they didn't both come in the same week, the same day, the same year. Could have been, but the other thing is with all that research in the 80s, they never turned up ceratocystis. So it wasn't widespread in ohia 30 years ago. So we still don't know, we don't know what it came in on. We don't know how we suddenly found two of them other than once you start looking for something, you find there's more of it than you figured there was. Wade, this is Wade Heller in the lab. He did the um, QPCR, the DNA analysis of finding out what the DNA is so that they could do this and figure out what it is. He's also the one who does most of the tests. So if you bring in your test to the lab, or the team brings in the lab, he's gonna give it to Wade, Wade's going to extract the DNA and run it. So he'll tell you tomorrow, does that have the DNA of psoriasis to B? Or, and usually they're running a fault, and then they culture it. They put it in culture to see if they can actually grow the fungus. Um, so that's kind of the test on it. I was very impressed. There is a psoriasis disease of oak trees on the mainland. It's causing problems in, in Wisconsin, Minnesota, all the way to Texas and the Midwest. They, they've been working on that since the 70s, mostly. Um, they're just now getting their QPCR DNA analysis of it. Wade did it in two years, we already got it here. So um, he's a pretty sharp guy. Um, let's go to sleep. No, oh, there we go. However, that is a big, expensive lab up here. Carter Atkinson works for the USGS here. And, and this was an interesting story just because um, USGS folks, the bio, they used to be Biological Resources Division, I forget what the acronym is. Anyway, there, there's a lab of them up the volcano. I knew him as a bird guy because he was studying the bird disease, the whole complex of the malaria on the birds. He's a molecular biologist. They came down and said, how can we help? Carter said, well, I know how to do genetic analysis. How can I help? And we talked about, well, we've, you know, this lag of running everything to lab. He went home and he invented what he calls a lab in a suitcase. So this is a small portable, goes in the back of the pickup truck, can go up into the forest and do the same D or similar DNA analysis and pick out what it is. So like when they went up to Kohala, they were run around the forest, get a bunch of seed, bring it back, test them on the back of the pickup truck in half an hour, have, have answers to it. So another neat uh, 
And any collaboration that USGS, you know, they came down and said, how can we help? We're still a lot of things that are unknown though. Um, so we've got a fungus, but how does the fungus, how does the pathogen affect the tree? It's not like all of us. There are diseases all over flooding the air, but we don't get sick because we don't get infected. What's the mechanism? It's wounding, how many spores, all these other things are still ongoing projects that we're looking at. We're also looking at what else does it occur on. Um, other ceratocystis happens on taro, on coffee, on sweet potato. Ours does not infect any of these. And one of the worries, of course, is let's say it infected taro. Then anybody moving taro around might be moving this disease around. But it doesn't. So we rule that one out. Cacao, we rule it out. This thing up here is called syngonium. I never knew what it was called before. This has a very similar disease, but not exactly the same. Like 99% the same fungus that affects this. Um, again, and again, as you know, all the Polynesian agricultural crops, the taro, the breadfruit, the sweet potato, they're all vegetatively propagated. So it's very easy to keep uh, a disease. When you share cutting materials, plant materials, you also share diseases. And then the disease stays in the same population. Um, this also is vegetatively propagated. Okia, we have, okay, please, how many, how many varieties of metrosidus polymorph are there? And we won't ask Elizabeth Stacy because she'll have the long, complicated answer, but the simple answer that's in the botany book is what? Two. More, more, more. There's, there's eight named varieties. Elizabeth's discovered lots more, so when she's done publishing it all, they'll be a lot more complicated, but for now, there's eight in the botany book. There are four other species of Ohia. What does it affect? So far, it affects what we've seen it going in. And there are many more around the world. So uh, we just returned from New Zealand where we saw the Pohutukawa, which is a coastal thing. It looks a lot like Ohia. And they have Arata up in the mountains, and there are many more. Caledonia is just full of different species of metrosidus. So what does it affect? We're starting some testing in the greenhouse uh, with Blaine Luis. And Blaine is a UHLO GCBS master's student. Um, so Blaine is, I should drag Blaine over here. I didn't think of that. Okay. If you see him, tell him that hey, you should have been there because your name was mentioned. Good, good, good. Blaine's doing some neat work of testing, just a small scale. We don't have the budget to really ramp it up, but testing to see of the Hawaiian species of metrosiders, what is it effect? I should have dragged Blaine over here. Some of the other results from the USDA, and when I'm talking about the pathology stuff, I see we, I mean, a big group. I'm the forester and I'm more the field guy. The lab and greenhouse stuff is done by the pathologist where Blaine is, and Blaine's working on that. Um, sanitation, alcohol kills it, ethanol isopropyl, simple green soap does not. So we're going to get into some of the disinfectant, how to disinfect things. Um, this is one of the really hopeful results. What this study was, was um, they took a culture in a test tube, heated it up to a certain temperature, cooled it down, and then played it out to see if they could grow it. And what they found is if you heated it up to um, 117 degrees F, plated it out, it grew fine. If you heated it up to 122 degrees F, plated it out, it was dead. So you don't have to heat it very hot. So we say now 130 to give ourselves a little bit of room of error, but um, 130 degrees will kill it. So that's good to know. Fungicides. Um, unfortunately, these kinds of vascular wilts, the fungi that go through the vascular tissue of a tree, are very difficult to manage with pesticides. There are no fungicides. Dutch elm disease, and they've spent many millions of dollars working on Dutch elm disease, there's no cure for it. What they do for Dutch elm disease is um, trees that have the disease get regular injections of a fungicide. They drill holes, they have a little pump or a little system that soaks the thing with fungicide, and they do it every year or two. Um, and what it does is it stops the fungus from growing. It doesn't cure the tree. If you stop doing it, the fungus would grow and the tree would die. Um, that would be a possibility um, for individual trees. If you have trees in the landscaping, culturally significant trees, champion trees that you wanted to keep treating, and if you had that treatment, it could be done. So we're starting some research on that. Uh, elm trees work very differently than ohia trees. Could you even get the fungicide into a tree? We is super dense. You know, we've got to start looking at that sort of thing. Some fungicides or two fungicides, propoconazole is one, I forgot the other, that seem to work on the fungus on a petri dish, but it's a lot of steps between fungus on a petri dish and um, up in the, in the tree.
Okay, how is it moving around? How do we get from Pune down through and up the Pune side? Um, an easy way for it to move around is by people moving infected lungs. Now this fungus is, it, wherever it infects the tree, it goes vertically up and down the sapwood, and it goes out in the radial cells. So that's when you see a cross section, you see a starburst pattern. There are other cells in the wood that go radially in the wood, like spokes on a wheel or a starburst. So it moves through that, and that's why you see the pattern. The black stuff you see is spores, it's thick concentrations of fungal spores. So if you have a tree that is dead and you cut it down and you bring your firewood from your home in Leilani to your cabin in a volcano, you have brought millions and millions of spores up the volcano. Um, so if you live in a volcano and you want to buy firewood, don't buy firewood from where you have infected wood here. This guy, so this is a load of infected firewood, but this guy lives in Leilani and cut down trees in his yard and then burned them in his wood stove, which is great, it's a good way to dispose of it, but moving it around. This load of logs wanted to go be a fancy house on Kauai. We tested these logs and we found out they were full of fungus and the owner of the logs was told, no, you may not ship them to Kauai because you would be shipping spores with this deadly fungus over to Kauai. I don't think the owner of the poles was happy to hear that, but um, that's true. So don't move wood around. The other thing though is we notice, we see a lot of trees that are off in the forest and they're dying. And how in the world does this happen? One thing we see a lot of trees get hit very badly with beetles. Um, so that's a little hole and the beetles, look, the, these are ambrosia beetles. So they're wood boring beetles, very small. Um, boring into the trees. Here's one on a dime, so it's, you know, it's two millimeters long. But millions of them bore into these trees and blow out a lot of sawdust. Because the beetles gone in the wood and drilled through the wood and blown out that sawdust, that sawdust is full of fungal spores. So this is very, very infective, very full of spores. When it lands on the ground underneath the tree and you drive off road in your truck and you get a lot of mud in your truck, you're carrying a lot of spores. That may also move it around. Um, one of the things we don't know, and we just started the experiment, is, well, how, long, how much of this does it take to infect the tree? So January, they went up a place where there's a lot of infection already, and they actually cut little wounds in the trees and packed sawdust in and covered it up. So we actually have a, um, an actual physical test of that idea that this stuff can spread disease. So we're going to see, when we cut down the tree, if we start seeing fungus growing in there, then we know that that can indeed cause that disease. How does it move longer distance though? We here all know the wind patterns. The winds come from the east or the northeast. The wind goes um, from Hilo to volcano, then it goes south around Kaul. So when the volcano's going off, all the bog goes Kaul and then up Kona side. That is also coincidentally the pattern that we see the disease spread. Now, so that's fitting a model to figure out are we actually seeing that? We're deploying these um, traps here. Carter's working on that too. It are traps that will uh, trap and see are we actually catching fungal spores in these traps um, along scattered around the island here. It's a little dicey because you know wind is not the same steady wind every day. Maybe a lot of it will be in a windstorm and then nothing for you. you know, so it's not a, 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 an easy easy thing to do. But at least we're we're looking at that to see if that's happening. One of the things that will be coming much more clear on though is that. A lot of what we see is wounded trees. Um, this is a tree on a ranch down in Kau. I'm not a big fan of cattle ranches. I see this landscape, I don't see any room for cattle in here. There's no grass in here. The cattle are stripping the trees because they're hungry. Those wounds got infected. This tree was all full of wounds. The wounds get infected on that. There's, so this is an outbreak that we're seeing next year, just this year, we just noticed it. Um, in Kaua Ranch that's got a big outbreak of that, of where the cattle are wounded the trees. Beetles. Um, Curtis Ewing, Curtis was, was he a lecturer? I know he worked here also as a, as a lecturer, I think. He's an entomologist. Yes, I think he still might be with UAP. He's working with us now. Okay. He's working with us on this, and his job is figuring out what in the world is going on with the beetles. So Curtis has set up both environmental traps, so in the forest, these big stacks of funnels, what are those called? They're not Malays, they're something else. Yeah, something like that. And also, um, little bottles where he sees one of those little boreholes, he puts a little bottle on and catches what comes out. The other thing is felling infected trees, putting them in cages in the lab and catching what comes out. So this is what's flying around. This is, a, it's actually in the trees. 
It turns out 85% are just one species of ambrosia beetle. Um, they're just really getting into the opiatrix there. It's a non-native species of ambrosia beetle. About 10% of those beetles have the fungal spores on them. Not surprising, they've been tunneling around in this infected wood, they have the fungal spores. What we're not sure about is if they are hitting healthy trees and infecting them, or if they are just going back to trees that are already infected. Bees can smell, uh, beetles can smell stressed trees. So if you stress a tree, it'll attract a lot of beetles. A new pathologist we just heard in October, though, he worked on a disease in Florida where uh, it's a laurel wilt. So it hits the bay laurel and it hits avocados. That one is vectored by beetles, and all it takes one beetle to hit a tree, and it will vector leads to that. So we're looking into what is the direct result of the beetle on there. Okay, don't move. Oh, how do we manage? How are we recommending people manage this? Again, the idea is it's a management. We want to try to stop it from spreading. How do we manage it? Don't move all here stuff around, please. Don't move around posts. This load of posts wanted to go to a walk, it would become something. It was found a little fungus, it was not allowed to be there. Um, that set of plants, the nursery also wanted to ship those to Oahu. Um, we told the Department of Ag, we can't inspect those. These, we cut the end off. You see that? We cut the end off, every one of those, and took them all as samples, um, and we found them. The trees, if we cut the end of every one off, then they'd all be dead, so we said, no, we can't sample them, and we can't tell you if it's safe to move those or not. So the Department of Ag, to their credit, told the owner of those, no, you may not sell those on the Oahu. Um, mulch. The county, this I took last month, so you could bring green waste to the county. The county would ship it up and someone else would pick it up in an hour, and I would go. So if you brought an affected Okia tree to the green waste, they would ship it up and give it to someone else. So you brought your tree from Pahoa, it was all full of ceratocystis, and someone would pick up the mulch and happily bring it up to Pahuilo, and that would be a great way of moving. So the county took two steps on that. One, they put signs up by the green waste station saying, do not put ohia in the green waste. So take it home. Even the guys, I, I drove up in my truck and asked, not even my state truck, I think it's my private truck, so it's kind of incognito. Hey, what do you do if some guy brings ohia? Hey, we tell them not bring them in. Okay, good. So keep it out of the green waste stream. But what the county started doing last month in February also was composting the green waste. So instead of freshly chipped mulch going out, they windrow it, it gets up to supposedly 160 degrees in the middle, turn it five times so it's all heated up in this process. So if any of it does get in, the heating process should um, destroy the fungal spores. So we're hoping that that um, also reduces the risk of it moving in mulch. Wounds, injuries, livestock wounding, equipment. Several spots in Volcano, what we've seen is a bunch of Ohia along a driveway then. Well, they made the driveway. See this tree, they bumped into the thing, and then when we took our sample, we found the disease there. Make the driveway, bump, bump, bump into the UV along the driveway. In the forest, they're okay. It's those ones you hit along the driveway that are dying from the fungus. Another one, they sent someone up to do some pruning. He used climbing spikes. When they looked in there, those holes from the climbing spikes were infected. So the animals wounding, equipment wounding, climbing spikes. If people go for hikes in the forest, and mark their trail by chopping blazes with a machete. I used to do that as a young man. That will definitely, that will, those trees will probably catch it and die. So don't wound Ohia trees. Cleaning off equipment. So this gets back to the, um, when you go through these infected forests, you pick up a lot of mud, and the mud about, what was it? About one out of 20 samples, tiny samples of mud have fungal spores. So if you get a lot of mud on you, guaranteed you got some fungal spores. Cleaning off your boots, cleaning off all your gear, your backpack and everything else like that, and pressure washing under vehicles. If I go off-road in Puna, I pressure wash her under my vehicle before I go to another part of the island just to clean it all out and uh, vacuum inside just to not move the mud around. This was a demo that, oh, I lost their logo. Big Island Invasive Species Committee has done a couple, there we go, there's their logo. So these guys, routinely go back and forth between really badly invaded forests and really pristine forests and are really good at sanitation. And they've done you know, field days and demos for us on it. Um, okay, 
So rat assistus is a really successful pathogen, partly because it has um, several different spore types. Some are hard shelled, and we found that the hard shelled spores, they go into a dormant stage, they can last for up to four years, because we've gone into trees that have been dead. I mean, the landowner said, yeah, that died back four years ago, and we can culture the fungus from there. So they can live a long time. Those are the ones that are gonna be in logs and sawdust. They also have sticky spores. The serratus disease of coffee and cacao and eucalyptus are spread by pruning. You prune an infected tree, you go down and prune another and another and another. You've just spread the disease because there are other spores that stick to your pruning tool as you go down. In um, Latin America, it's called malvenchete because the machete spreads the disease. Um, so disinfectant, the thing to disinfect, any cutting tool that cuts into nohia should be disinfected before it cuts something else. 70% rubbing alcohol is the easiest, cheapest, least corrosive thing. 15 seconds for that. I carry spray bottles in my vehicles. Spray if I'm sampling just between trees. Um, for a hatchet machete, it's easy. For a chainsaw, it's hard. You have to take the whole thing apart and not pull the dust out, soak it, put it back together, and run it to re-oil it and stuff like that. But uh, yeah. 10% um, bleach solution will work, but you have to mix it up fresh, and it's kind of a pain if bleach corrodes stuff. There's not much real reason to use bleach when you can use rubbing alcohol. What do I do if I have a tree? Now, oh, let me know. Yeah, go ahead. Let me know. Um, we're really, like I said, we're really trying to keep track of incipient things. So the ones that are coming up in Volcano, the ones that are in Pucayao, um, the ones that are in Coloco Malca, those ones we want to know if there are cases of that and find and follow up on that. And that's what Tim Toombs and his group are being real helpful. Find out, find us off. Maybe we can control it in those more pristine areas. Leilani, Nanavali, Orkland, Hawaiian Acres. We know it's there. Paradise Park, Hilo. There's tons of it there. Thank you for letting me know, but I, I know already that there's a lot of it there. Not new. In an area that's a new area that's mostly healthy Ohia forest, you want to control it. We're working on the idea that a tree like this is going to attract a lot of beetles that are going to produce a lot of sawdust and spread the disease around. Therefore, it's better to get it on the ground. Beetles are not attracted to trees on the ground. Trees on the ground is going to rot faster. But what we recommend is people knock them down and cover them up. Have them cut down. I, am, I see people cut down trees, and it scares me. Most people have no idea. Even a small tree can kill you. Um, I do not advise anybody cut down trees. I advise them to have a professional cut down trees. Okay, I know that a lot of people cut down trees, but I also see a lot of people doing really dangerous stuff. I use chainsaws, I cut down trees, and it's dangerous stuff if you don't know what you're doing. Dangerous if you do know what you're doing. One thing I saw is putting a tarp around it to collect the sawdust, and then wrapping up the tarp and disposing it or something, getting rid of it, collecting the sawdust on it, covering it with the tarp to keep the beetles out. And like after three to six months, it will be no longer really attractive but hoping to slow it down. Firewood, again, it makes great firewood. I was corrected by the fire marshal in Volcano when I had to say burn it. He said people will go out, people on this island will go out and just light something like that and watch it go. That's not what we mean. We mean <laughs> in your wood stove. So I do not say in any fireplace, smokehouse, or emu. Um, agricultural burning, there are people ag burn permits. Um, so you have to be a legitimate farmer ranch and you have to get your permit for agricultural burning. So it's not a Thing for homeowners to do. You're not supposed to just be burning stuff in your backyard as a homeowner. If you're a farm or ranch, you can get a permit. The permit takes, then you just get a permit to go burn whenever. So if you do burn outside, please pay attention to wind and humidity and all those things that you should when you're lighting fires. We have a lot of wildfires from Hawaii. Um, side tidbit as much of percentage of our state burns every year as Colorado, um, California, Nevada, all these big fire areas. Um, we have a lot of wildfire here in Hawaii. So with the, oh, I already covered this. I already covered this, the compost. This is what it was doing a month ago. Fresh green stuff goes right out. Now it's being put in this. Hawaii Department of Agriculture very um, proactively put forth a quarantine on Ohia saying, um, we explained to them what was going on. It's only on the big island. They said, okay, quarantine, you can't ship OB off the big island. You can't ship leaf, flowers, wood, nothing off the big island unless it's treated. Um, 
they did the temporary, and then November, it was made a permanent rule not to ship Okia off the Big Island. I think they were proactive on that. There are plenty of things. There was some whining from some um, the nursery business, whatever, but really, this is such a bad thing that it's, it's really important to stop this from moving. So far, after scores and scores of samples taken from suspect trees from the other islands, nothing on the other islands has not been discovered. And we've had samples from Molokai, Lanai, Maui, Kauai, and Oahu. It has not been discovered on the other islands. So, so far, that seems to be working. Um, treated lumber is kiln dried, so it's heated and it would kill any fungal spores that can move. Um, Ogea posts, on the other hand, are not kiln dried because I've seen Ogea posts this big and it would take a year in a kiln to dry one of those. So, those are not kiln dried. We're, we're looking at other treatments to allow those to move, but that's. Um, Another one of the many projects. Uh, Saturday, here at UH Hilo, last Saturday, we had a morning long symposium. This is highlights of that, but it was a three hour, each scientist rolled out his or her own project and get time for question and answer. April 1st, we're having one in Kona. If you know someone in Kona who needs to know about this, like someone who lives in Coloco Malca, really got to rattle the pages of Coloco Malca and get them done there. We have incipient ones in Coloco Malca, and that like volcano is a community in an Ovia forest. We really don't want to see it spreading there. Um, but we're having that symposium. We do a lot of other community talks. If some of you are in a community that needs to hear about it, and I've already given several talks in Volcano, but in another community that needs to hear about this, Saturday night I'm going up to Kukaya, I'll give a talk there. Um, somewhere at least once a week, we're giving a talk on, on this in some community. Yeah, this week will be three talks. This is the this is the drill sampling, by the way. One of the things Wade figured out is we were just using hatchet to chop samples, but a drill is quicker, less damaging to the tree, but a little less apt to get the fungus. When you're chopping, you actually see what you're chopping into the drill, you don't see it. But it's another way of collecting samples of drilling and just catching the shavings in the bag. This is a real key, what it looks like. So this black is the fungus. Our website, all the stuff we have is up on rapidohiadev.org, uh, map and uh, how to do it and sampling methods and all that other kind of stuff. And we have a Facebook page that people who like to write in Facebook for answers, we have a team of people who answers things on the Facebook page as well. Um, so that's for more information and um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Maybe you already answered this question, but how, how long does it take to kill a mature tree? I didn't, and we don't know. See, we know it takes two to four weeks from when we see visual symptoms to when it dies. But so what, what happens, what we're seeing is as this fungus spreads in the tree, the tree is trying to block the spread of the fungus. At some point, it hits a tipping point where the tree blocks its own vascular system in trying to block the fungus, and there's no more water that goes to canopy, and whole thing shuts down. Now, is that six months after the initial infection, a year, three months? We don't know. We don't know at all. We haven't been chopping down green trees to look for the fungus. We're so busy chopping down trees we're going to see. But yes, that's another one of the projects to try to figure that out. January, we just did the first inoculations of appearingly healthy trees up stain back a whole lot. Oh, I should have mentioned, shoot, now that I was here at Uachilo, I should have mentioned that. Ryan Perot is doing some neat work, and I don't have his little video. So I showed you Greg Asner's flight of the whole island with an airplane. Ryan Perot is a professor here who does drones. So a drone does real good imagery on a real small scale. So he's got a 400-acre patch of forest up and down Stainback that he looks at every month. He flies the drone back and forth, back and forth, and gets an image of that. So he's got a time series of trees falling out up and down that area. Um, and they just used drones again and looking, they found a couple suspect Lafoy, but they flew up. When they found the one big tree in Lafoy in November, Ryan brought his drone out two days later and they flew up and he just flew around looking around the forest over that, you know, 100 acres to see uh, are there any other symptomatic. And there were, but they were dead of some other cause, none of them else was positive. But the airplane covers everything with massive amounts of data, you know, once a year. The drone can go out tomorrow. I mean, the airplane to get out, the airplane out is a year or two's worth of work to get the airplane. 
The drone Ryan can go out tomorrow and fly 100 acres. So they're complementary technologies. And again, Ryan's one of those guys that how can I help? What can I do? Can drones be helpful? Yeah, they can be helpful. So he's trying to fit his drone out with some of the spectrophotometry now, which is cool because then you'll be able to get that water stress information from the, the drone. Uh, so the, the essentially the tree kills itself. You know, I mean, I guess you could say that the fungus killed the tree because the fungus blocks a lot of it, but also right. the tree is having a reaction to it right. at a physiological basis. Wow. And my other question is, we, we, we don't know how it got here. No, because we've been hoping we found out, aha, it must have come in on this plant and we could stop it. So there are a couple things that could happen. It could come in on something else that we don't know. It could have been the fungus that's hitting it now could be a hybrid between two other kinds of stratocystis that's in it. So let's say, I mean, we don't really know how many different kinds of um, genotypes are on the, the syngonium. Maybe some from Florida had a different genotype and some they brought in from Cuba, I don't know, and then the two hybridized and it was able to jump over there. If that's the case, we'll never know, because if it was a one-off event, we'll never know. Or it could be just a mutation. So we may never know. Wow. Other than trees that have like no wounds or anything like that and are really vigorous, is there any, you seen any promise of like natural genetic uh, events? Any, any promise in that way? And the other question is um, asymptomatic trees. I know you said you don't know how long it takes to kill them off, but are you finding asymptomatic trees that are infected or colonized and they can spread it? Yeah. So the second thing is we don't sample asymptomatic trees yet. I mean, we're, we're busy chopping symptomatic ones. So we don't know that. The first one is, even in the worst areas, you find some trees that don't have the disease yet. So again, we got the pathologist on board who's the more, so Wade is the pathologist, more the molecular guy. Mark is more the, um, the plant and the nursery guy. He's gearing up to do that. Part of the resistance thing that I showed that Blaine was starting with some other seedlings, part of what he's gonna be doing is, because you can root with here pretty easily, try to find some of those ones that aren't dead yet in the bad disease area, bring them into the lab, in the nursery, and test them. You know, inoculate them, see do they get the disease. Because maybe they, maybe they are resistant, maybe you'll inoculate them, they won't get the disease, and that would be the center for a, a propagation program, or maybe they're just a lucky tree and as soon as you inoculate them, they're down. So that's what we, that's what we run over to. Thanks. What different uh, colored flowers, is there any indication that uh, particular colored trees are more vulnerable? No, there's no indication yet that one of the ink varieties of some are more or less vulnerable than others. But we've just done a few dozen, you know, it's going to be thousands of, of inoculations to see. see that. Yeah, our, our neighbor in Volcano, who we have observed two trees among many that are beautiful and green, uh, all the leaves are brown on two fairly large yeah. telephone sized trees. Um, we're still waiting test results. Um, the owner is very cooperative um, and says, Ron, call Tim, do whatever's yeah, necessary. I wanna, I wanna help. Um, I hear stories of other landowners who know that they have infected trees and either don't care or are unable to do anything and I was interested in putting in that quarantine. Is there any uh, push towards saying, if you've got infected trees, private land, I mean, you've got to take care of them? Uh, no, the only rules now for that are the unsafe floor, which is if your tree is posing a hazard. So if your neighbor's tree dies, and it's going to drop a branch on your phone line, then they have to take care of it. Um, however, just for this, there's no rule on this. I, to be honest, I haven't run into that. We've had everybody we've talked to who's been, yeah, what needs to be done? Now, the hard thing is some people may not be able to afford. If you call uh, tree works and you say, I got a tree like this, got to come down, you're going to get a bill for several thousand dollars. Um, so we've been discussing with the county options if the county can help with this or the options that, that. That's where we run into people say, hey, I can't afford it. Right now, what we have though, is Big Island Invasive Species Committee got a couple hundred thousand dollar grant from uh, USGS. And so there's a crew that's going down felling things in incipient areas. So there's, you know, we haven't run into anybody who's just being stubborn with long, all kind of down, don't mess with me. We run into people say, hey, 
if you guys want to take it down, go ahead, because I can't afford it. And we run into people say, yeah, no, I'll take it down myself. Is there any other sort of psoriasis infections in the world that sort of have insight to how they treat for psoriasis elsewhere? Sure. Problems that can be applied or vice versa? Sure. Um, although a lot of it we're figuring out um, also examples that don't apply. So the, uh, and we, we paid a bunch of attention to how they deal with the psoriasis disease of plane trees in Europe. And oak trees in in North America um, the plane trees is mainly a urban problem or urban uh, problem the other thing in both of those the disease mostly travels through root grafts and we don't think it's happening here um, so a lot of theirs is so the cutting felling of infected trees but they're what they actually do so if you have a row of plane trees and one gets infected what they do is first they kill its two neighbors then they cut the infected one because they found out if you just cut the infected one, the roots are grafted, immediately all the sap, infected sap goes to its two neighbors and kills the two neighbors. So first they kill the neighbors and then they cut down the infected tree. So they, they, they're felling and getting rid of trees. Yes, that's used in oak, that's used in plane trees. Um, for eucalyptus plantations, it's pruning sanitation. Coffee, cacao, it's pruning sanitation. Some of these others though, the fungus forms mats on the surface of the tree and that's moved by insects. The only time we see that is if there's that wounding like a cow that stripped the tree. Mostly this is internal. So it's not spreading the same way that oak wilt or plain wilt is. And it's not spreading the same way as the coffee and cacao disease because they're spread by pruning. That maybe in part of an effect that you can do that just how dense the wood is. Since when you grow it, it be a different mechanism. It's just that the, that the species of fungus is reproducing differently. I came in late, so I might have covered this already, but I've seen some of the lots in Elon in certain areas where there's a hundred trees on the lot, 98 are dead, and two are struggling, you know. Mm -hmm. Is that typical of the worst areas? You're getting close to That's the worst areas, areas. yeah. Yeah, you got 98% mortality in the worst areas. Is there an average you could throw out there, roughly? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Or is it just like... No, so one of the, well, the number I can throw out with you is um, 10 to 15% mortality per year in a given stand. Um, one of the other projects I didn't talk about is my colleague Clint Hughes. He has about 50 plots out in the forest where he's going and measuring each year. And he's got, you know, one year data. This summer he's going to get this next year. But you're getting about that level of mortality. So in five to ten years, they're dead. The whole stand is dead. You know, so he's getting that percentage per year. One of the other interesting things that he's finding, though, is um, the stands with bigger trees have higher percent mortality than the stands with smaller trees. Maybe because the bigger trees have accumulated more wounds, more broken branches, more crotches that attract sawdust than the smaller trees. Anyway, speculation, but that's the data that stands of smaller trees having less mortality than stands of larger trees. The idea of how long the fungus or in the spores remain viable in the soil outside the tree? Oh, in the soil, uh, we don't have experimental data. The pathologist says the soil is not going to remain viable that long. You know, in the order of months. In a standing dead tree, is a real good fight over environment. That we know will live for at least four years. But so in the soil, probably months, but not years. It, once it's once the wood rots, there's all kinds of other fungi. In it. it doesn't compete with other fungi very well. Once the thing rots, then the pathogen is going to get overtaken and wiped out by the rot fungi. It's uh, the fungal spores, you know, that are running vertically, yep. basically. Do those go all the way down the root tips also? They go both directions, or is it so we it see like an obvious infection site? When we've and cut up the trees, when we fell trees and cut them up, we see different indications. Okay. I think more often we see it ground level going up, and as you take sections, eventually you get to a clear spot in the branches, you don't see fungus anymore. But definitely sometimes there's a lot of infection further up, you know, chest high or 15 feet up, and then you get less as you go down. Most of this has been Puna, so we haven't dug out too many roots because it's lava. Um, a couple that we have, we found some staining in it, and at least a couple. So it can go into the woody fissure roots. We think that maybe a wound could be a root in a lava. So you have a big lever on a tree moving back and forth, the roots in the lava, that level of abrasion could be enough. If there's fungus in the soil there,
Any other questions? I'm happy to talk with you. <laughs> you talk about these other trees on the mainland, 60 years, 100 years. What, what from a planning perspective, um, funding-wise, do you foresee that there's enough funding? Because there's a lot of interesting research that a lot of people are doing, but that's because there's an influx of money now. Um, what do you foresee like um, in the future, like 10 years out? Is it sustained? And if it doesn't come in as far as the funding, what, what is it most? if it's possible to speculate. Well, what we, I mean, obviously, the, the hardest thing, I think, is to get people in Honolulu and elsewhere sufficiently alarmed about it um, that they fund it. So you remember this year when there was a big hoo-hoo when the fire ants were discovered in Oahu? It was like Honolulu finally realized there's fire ants. So we've been suffering for a long time with fire ants. It doesn't really matter very much to them in Honolulu. <laughs> so I think it's to get, once it gets on a radar and then gets standardized as a part of what people do, I think our big uh, jump right now that we're, we're really trying to make the leap of faith from the, the foundation one year, two year grants to steady state and federal, and there's been a lot of federal funding also, but it's been like, well, where's some money that isn't being used here? We'll throw it at it. We're add it. The other thing is that getting people to realize the magnitude of it. I mean, I didn't even outline all the projects. Each of these projects has got to have, I mean, ideally, it's going to have a head scientist, a postdoc, a couple technicians, lab, that kind of stuff. There are 12 to 15 separate projects going on. So this fall, we put together a plan of what we would need to attack this. And it came for like three and a half million dollars a year for the whole thing, which when the thing that we stand to lose is our native Hawaiian forest, all the other stuff becomes moot. The little birds are going to go, and the little rare insects are going to go, and the watersheds, all, you know, all the stuff is going to go if we lose the forest. Um, so that's not a big investment to save our forest. However, it is hard to get people that are not professional conservation to understand. You mentioned it was one um, uh, ambrosia beetle that was um, born into the, the trunk where it yep. is. Is, is it an invasive species? The beetle? Uh, yeah, I mean, invasive, it's a non native species. So there are also native ambrosia beetles in the same genus. There's some native and some non native. The natives could also spread this, but almost all the ones that Curtis has caught. Are these non-native ones? There have been a couple locations that have been these, these, and almost all it's just one species. It's a non-native species. Whether it's invasive, I can't tell you if it's something that is doing harm actively or it's just something that's non-native happens to be there. It's related to coffee twig borer. Uh, it's related to coffee beetle border. Again, it's related to the coffee berry borer and the black twig borer, both of which are very harmful agricultural pests. Are there any actions to get rid of it? Um, no, no. Ambrosia beetles are very difficult to get rid of. You see all the efforts they're trying to do on the coffee berry borer. And, and, you know, so in terms of funding, they've got 10 times the funding for coffee berry borer that we do for this. And that's just one crop, not the entire forest. So, yeah. Uh, but no, because the beetles are inside, they're inside a berry until wood. So, even if you're going to go spray insecticides around the forest, it wouldn't face the beetles because they're inside the trees. They're really hard to control. It's not a good biocontrol for them. The fungus they're using for the coffee berry borer, but that's in a in a coffee patch where you're going and applying the fungus regularly in a small controlled area. So There's not not really not to keep the numbers way down, and we've got so many of them here now. That, that's the same where they cross through the screens and gets on you. You feel it because they got quite a bit of weight to them. No, I, I don't oh, no. think so. I don't think that they would have. Uh, this, this. Uh, what about other trees? Does the one that's causing this infection or? Yeah, like, yeah. Um, they like I think they trees. said it likes eucalyptus. I think Curtis said it likes eucalyptus too. Does it have an elevation range? Yeah, they tend to have elevation ranges. So the non native one tends to be mid to lower, but in the higher elevation ones, and a couple things, they've seen a bunch of the native ones. But we're doing, Curtis is doing a lot of trapping around the island to try to get an idea of, now that this thing again is causing a problem, we have money to attack it, to try to find the ecology of where the thing is, the different, where are the different populations, and what is their timing too, because if you don't go and find it now, maybe it's just not there, you don't see it in the winter, but you'll see it in the summer. And what's the question about how to get rid of the people? 
Because Because they, they pheromone traps are for sampling. So you can sample, you can put out pheromone traps to sample the population, but they don't catch up fields to control the population. Yeah. yeah. So they're not knocking down the population. You're catching some so you know if they're there. I love the How long do we have? I don't think Ohia is going to go extinct. There will be areas that used to be dominated by Ohia forest that will now be dominated by guava and Albizia and those things. Uh, there will be still areas that are a lot of Ohia in them. Uh, I think a lot of the beekeeper folks, I've given at least two talks to beekeeper folks though, are down in that lower Pune area where uh, there was a lot of Ohia forest, but there will be a lot less Ohia forest back there. The rest of the state doesn't have lowland Ohia forest. Most people don't even see Ohia unless you're up in the mountains. Any other questions for Dr. Friday? That was right. a great talk. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.